Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. For decades, starting in the 1930s, a rite of passage for those visiting New York City was a trip to Radio City Music Hall to see a movie and a stage show or to see the Christmas or Easter show featuring the high-kicking Rockettes. But that privilege came close to disappearing when in 1978, the management of Rockefeller Center announced that it was closing the theater whose productions had thrilled so many. Would anyone step in to save it? In her new book, Rosemary Novellino Mearns, who spent 12 years dancing with the Radio City Music Hall Ballet Company, tells the previously untold story of how she and the other performers, artists, and employees led the campaign that saved the music hall and led to its becoming the official landmark that it is today. Saving Radio City Music Hall, a dancer's true story, has just been published by Turning Point Press. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You grew up in suburban New Jersey. Mm -hmm. What was your original source of inspiration to become a ballet dancer? My teacher. Um, I was trained by Irene Vokin, who was part of the famous Vokin Russian ballet family. Very strict teacher. Oh, my goodness gracious. She scared me to death when I was a kid. But once I became a, a young teenager, I thought, this is all I want to do. And she became my mentor and my friend. Okay. And it was because of that that I wanted to be a ballet dancer. And you had a brother who, who brought you to see a real ballet into the city when you were 10 years old and yes. you were 16. Yes. How cool is that? That I mean, is my very My brother never cool. did anything like that for me. No, nah, my brother's still <laughs> doing that kind of stuff for me. Nino is my brother. Yeah, he did that. That was great. That was what an adventure. What did you see? Sleeping Beauty? Sleeping Beauty. Okay. The Royal Ballet, Sleeping Beauty at the Old Met. Mm-hmm. Uh, the beautiful Old Met. So in 1964, you headed for New York City to, to try for a ballet career, but first you had to go to secretarial school. Oh, you did your homework. Yes, my father insisted I had something to fall back on, and I went to secretarial school. I don't even think they call that secretarial school anymore, for a year. And the minute I graduated, I'm still a very fast typist, by the way, uh, I went and auditioned for the music hall. The ballet company is different from the Rockettes, yes. correct? They were two completely separate groups. Most people didn't even know the ballet existed. The Rockettes are the stars. They were and they still are. And the ballet always felt like stepchild because no one knew we existed. But we did. And there were some very famous people who went through the ballet company and some famous choreographers that choreographed for the company, too. And the ballet dancers are the ones who perform in the, the routines, the different story, the dances that, yeah, that, the, the, in that my, are not the rockets. Right. In my day, they used to show films at the music hall. And the show would be about 45 minutes long. And there would be an actual classical ballet like in the beginning of the show. Oh, really? And then there were singers, and then the Rockettes would perform, and then we'd all come out and do a finale or whatever. Um, but, yeah, it was cl usually classical until in the 70s. They started to bring in contemporary choreographers. Uh, they brought in Ronnie Lewis from Las Vegas. Uh, they brought in Miriam Nelson from Hollywood. Uh, Leonidoff, who was one of the famous producers there, uh, when, do you remember the song Raindrops Are Falling? Right, right. She did the choreography for that on the Academy Awards and the, with the bicycles and all this stuff. And Leonidoff, Leon Leonidoff, brought her in and she choreographed the same number for the ballet for an Easter show. Okay. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Upside down on a bicycle. So you, um, you auditioned three times I did. and were hired the third time. Yes. What year was this? 1966. Okay. Um, so describe the atmosphere in the, uh, the ballet company. It seemed like a, a kind of mean girl kind of thing was going on. It was. We didn't call it that then, but that's what it was. When you first were hired there, it was a very scary, cold feeling. Uh, the woman who was the dance captain at the time, after you were told you were hired, walked you to the costume department and walked you there was a nurse there and you had to have a physical and then brought you down to the dressing room she never said congratulations welcome she never smiled and you're like oh my god oh my god and you went into the dressing room and the girls were very um most of them not all of them were very cold it was like you had to prove yourself to be accepted mm -hmm. and um 
luckily I sat down next to, I was put in this row in the dressing room and I sat down next to this charming um, young woman called Pammy Green. <laughs> and she was the only one that smiled and told me what to do. And to this day, how many years, 40 years later, she's still my best friend. Were the ballet dancers all the same kind of physical type? I know there were probably no white, black, or, I'm sorry, there were white, but probably no black or Latino or Asians in the ballet company. Well, then. no, most of them were white, but there were uh, two black girls. One came in, her name was Rosemary, and she came in for a very short amount of time. We had another black dancer there, um, uh, we called her Betty Ann, Elizabeth. Thompson Hubbard, who was a permanent member, though she was a light-skinned black. Uh, there were Asian girls who came through. Yeah, okay. there were a few Asian girls. Okay. Uh, one of them now is the, uh, the costume designer at the Metropolitan Opera. Oh, I, oh, Sylvia. Sylvia was her first name. I forget her last name. Oh. But you were separate. Did, was there any interaction with the Rockettes, or were you very separate? No, we, our dressing room was on the 50th Street side of the building. The Rockettes were on 51st Street. Side. Okay. What was your work schedule like? Uh, you worked seven days a week for three, four, or five weeks, and you got a week off. We rehearsed in between shows, rehearsed in the morning before the first film, first show. We rehearsed after the first show, and sometimes we rehearsed uh, between the third and fourth show. The um, third break, we had three breaks, was considered dinner break and they couldn't rehearse you on that. The union finally came in and said you can't rehearse on that. Uh, and we would start rehearsals two weeks before the new show. Mm -hmm. The shows changed every time the film changed. Okay. Yeah. So what was it like appearing on the stage Fabulous. of the music? This is the largest, yeah. this is, is it the largest hall, uh, indoor hall? It was. I don't know if it still is. Okay. But it is enormous. And I do remember the very first time I, w I had a stage rehearsal and went downstairs and walked out onto that stage. I had been an audience member for years and the lights were on. And I do remember internally going, <gasps> because it's, it's stunning. And it's so big. And the musical is so open because of the design, the Art Deco design. It's different than a, a Broadway stage, which they're more narrow. Right. Or even the Metropolitan Opera House is more narrow. It's just so open, and it looks so enormous that it took your breath away. A little scary, intimidating for an 18-year-old. So this was a temporary job. After the show closed, you had to re-audition for the next show? No. Is that how, no? No. If you, uh, if you became permanent, uh, the first time I was only hired for the one show. And then they, they needed extra dancers, so they hired, I think, six of us. They were doing a big Chopin number. And then they only kept one, and they let the rest of us go. We all thought we were going to be permanent. Uh, came back <clears throat> a second time, and I worked six months. And then I was let go again. And then I came back the third time, and I stayed. And I was permanent. And so you, you had a steady job. You were working in New York City. You had a steady job as a ballet dancer, working every single day. It was, it was like a dream come true. So it was a year round. Thing. Yes, it was. That place was open 365 days okay, a year. Okay, okay. You eventually became uh, was it assistant dance captain, and, and then dance and captain. And then dance yeah, captain. Right. And you made some changes. I did. I decided once I became dance captain, I didn't want any of the new people to go through what I went through. So I would bring them into the dressing room and I would introduce them and say, ladies, this is our new dancer, whatever their name was, welcome them. And everything got lighter. And the music hall also, I don't think they do this anymore, but they went by the English system of direction on stage. They used prompt and OP. Prompt was right, OP was left. They didn't say go to stage right or go to stage left. And they didn't explain that to you. So you're out there in the middle of this huge stage for your first stage rehearsal, and they're screaming, go prompt, go prompt, go prompt. And you don't know what it means. No. Right. And I think probably Pammy grabbed me and said, Sophie, here, come with me. So I explained all that to the new people that came in. I thought, wouldn't it be better if you explain this so they, they're not floundering around? Yeah. So I did. I did implement some changes. Now... 
you, in your 12 years of dancing there, you performed in many kinds of dance performances. Uh, tell me about some of the more spectacular or odd kinds of... Well, I was lucky as far as the ballet. Uh, they, there was a woman who was there in the 50s, 40s and 50s, called Florence Rogge, choreographer. And she did all those big spectaculars, Bolero, these are the three famous ones, Rhapsody in Blue and the Undersea Ballet. And the music hall did repeat them every 10 years. And I was fortunate enough that I got to do all, four of the, all three of those. They were huge, huge. And at the end of the ballet, they would bring the Rockettes in in the same costume, so it looked like there were 100 people on that mm -hmm. stage. Um, uh, we did mostly classical ballet on point, but then in the 70s, early 70s, they started to bring in guest choreographers. Uh, they brought in Ronnie Lewis from Las Vegas. He did three numbers for us. T I mean, really Vegas style thing, head rolls and all that. There wasn't a point two or a two two to be found. And uh, that was interesting. Um, they brought in Miriam Nelson from Hollywood to repeat what she did on the Academy Awards. That was when raindrops? Raindrops are that falling you did in with, head, yeah, on with bicycles. bicycles. We, we started on bicycles and did all these tricks. It was a lot of fun. Hector Zaraspi from um, Joffrey came in and did a pure Mexican number. He was Mexican. And the whole show was Mexican, but we did a, an authentic Mexican number. So a lot of guests came in, too. And then in the, it, Peter Gennaro was hired. He came in as a guest. Peter was a television and Broadway choreographer and the nicest man I've ever worked for. And uh, Peter did, when he came in, he did a, a point number for us, and we did a musical theater number. So we had two numbers. And then when he became permanent, he became the um, head producer and resident choreographer for the dance ballet. Um, he started doing just theater numbers for mm -hmm. us. So now you did, did. You got to be Mary Poppins in one number. Right? I I did. That was a Leonidoff show when Disney World opened. The year after it opened, the whole theme was Disney. Leonidoff always had a theme, and so the Disney folks coming with those costumes and of course the ballet were going to wear them not the rockettes and some of the singers and they said we want the tallest brunette to be mary poppins and so i got to fly i came down as mary poppins uh the foy company the famous foy flying company mm -hmm. who was still in existence i had rehearsals with this man and he taught me what to do but i had to just come straight down you know right and mary poppins and they, um, I'm not going to give all this away, but it's in the book, but they didn't pay for a double harness, which is on your hip. They gave me a harness on the back of my back, which makes you do Peter Pan. I'm flying. So to keep my body very straight, as Mary Poppins, all the pressure was on one part of my anatomy, which was very painful. The story is in the book. Okay, but you lived through it. <laughs> yes, I did. It was an interesting experience. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with more with Rosemary Novellino Mearns after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Rosemary Novellino Mearns author of Saving Radio City Music Hall, A Dancer's True Story. So around 1974, you met your husband, mm -hmm. who was in the Singing. music hall yes. chorus and, and had played the part of a piano playing rabbit. <laughs> That's right. Oh, you did read the book. Um, when the ba the ba in 1974, the ballet was uh, let go. And uh, Peter Gennaro hired a lot of new young singers to do solos. And Bill was one of them. And then we, Peter decided he wanted more dancers than just the Rockettes for his upcoming Easter show. So there was a big audition in New York. And everybody came, including all of us. And about half of us were hired back, and they hired new people. And uh, that's where I met Bill, yes. Uh, what I thought was going to be the end of my life turned out to be the best part of my life. Did meeting him change your whole mindset about working at Radio City, or just made it No, better? it was just more fun. 
Okay. <laughs> were there a lot of in-house romances? Yes, there were. There were quite a few, yes. Um, this was the first for me, but there were a lot between musicians and stagehands. There was a lot of people that worked there. There right. were 500 employees. Right. Yeah, there were. In January of 1978, uh, the music hall management announced that it was going to be closing Radio City Music Hall that April, and you had to read about it in the Daily News. Um, later, you figured out that this was part of a scheme by the owners of Rockefeller Center to capitalize off of the, the real estate. You decided, I guess it was on the, what would have been... The day of the announcement, really. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so, what inspired you and your bill, I don't know if you were married then, no, we to organize the performers to fight the closing of the hall? In a word, passion. Uh, when they made the announcement, we were in a state of shock. There were rumors going around, but we, you know, we were all in denial that that was going to happen. The films were getting very bad. Houses were pretty empty. But when the announcement was made, it was like a, a, someone punched you in the stomach. And I... I still am passionate about that building. It's unique, it's brilliantly Art Deco, and the stage does things like no other stage can do. And I thought, they can't, they were gonna tear it down. I, they can't, they can't. And passion just welled up in me that day. I didn't know what to do. I was a dancer. I didn't, didn't, never did anything like this before. And went down, because I was dance captain, I had privy to an office there. And Bill and I went back down to that office after the announcement. There was a press conference, and all the captains of the departments were invited to this press conference, and Bill had become captain of the singers, and so we were both there. And I, it's well described in the book, but I just thought I have to do something, and I didn't know what to do. And I finally picked up the phone in that office, and I called NBC across the street. And I got a positive response which led to another phone call, which led to another phone call, and all of a sudden we were booked on a local TV show to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And it was after that TV show that I came back and I said to Bill, okay, we have to do something. And we called a meeting of all the employees. And that was the beginning of the Show People's Committee to Save Radio City Music That's correct. Hall. That's correct. There was a frenzy of organizational activity that followed. Uh, and the Hilton Hotel uh, oh. dominated office space. You circulated a petition very calling for the music hall to be saved. And you sought out more publicity. You were on the Joe Franklin show. I was on Joe Franklin. I did Tom Snyder's show uh -huh. out in California. What a nice man he was. Um, uh, Art Athens from CBS Radio. You may have even met him in your, in your career. Uh, no longer with us, but oh my God, what a help he was. What a help. The Hilton Hotel on 6th Avenue and 54th Street gave us an office for free for three months. Right. And it was ground floor. And um, they were wonderful. Uh, we had celebrities that helped us out. Um, so when you weren't, so all of this is while you're performing daily. Yes. Well, the Christmas show, they made the announcement the last week of the Christmas show. Then we were all off until the Easter show. So for January and February, we were at the Hilton every single day. Mm -hmm. Then in March, we went in to start rehearsals for the Easter show. Um, so it was three intense months of every single day of our life. Uh, trying to figure out what to do to right. cause publicity. And honestly, we wanted to embarrass the Rockefeller organization, which we did. Now, Joseph Rosenberg, he oh. was the head of the Municipal Arts Society, yes. Historic Districts Council, yes. and he was connected to the landmarks, the City Landmarks Preservation Commission, suggested that you seek landmark status for the auditorium as opposed yes. to for the building. Joe wrote us a letter. We made posters, and Joe wrote us a letter. I'm calling him Joe because we're still very good friends. And when I read his letter, I saw that he was involved with Grand Central. And he put his phone number in there, so I called him. Charming man answered the phone, the most charming man in the world answered the phone because I was nervous. And he came in. I said, would you come in and talk to us? And he literally guided us, took us by the hand, and told us, what to do and he said we had the the works were in place to make the theater landmark he said do the interior not the exterior the exterior is the shell they can turn it into anything they want to but if you do the interior 
it has to remain a theater. And we were like, I'm mean, literally mouth drop. Okay. And we did. And, and was it your committee that applied, made the application for landmark status? No, it, it, we were part of it. But Marianne Krupsack, who was the lieutenant governor at the time, uh, jumped on the bandwagon. And uh, it was between her and the UDC and us and this whole group together did that. Okay. Uh, and, um, the now, there were factions on your committee. There was the Rockettes group and there was your group, right? It was one big group, but uh, there were some uh, people who are mentioned in the book that I probably won't mention here that were on the committee that um, uh, the problem was it turned into, uh, with her, an ego problem rather than a sincere issue to save the building. And I had no time for egos. We were there to save a building. It was completely pure of heart and pure of mind on my part, my side. It, I wasn't trying to save my job anymore. Right. And it was different with the, her. So there was a hearing before the Landmarks Commission in March 1978, and you testified? Absolutely. And we presented the petitions at that time, and we managed to get 500 thousand signatures on petitions mm -hmm. and the petitions if anybody is landmarking anything are extremely valuable okay for that so um on march 28th two weeks before the april 12th deadline mm -hmm. when the theater was yeah. going to close you learn that the auditorium had 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 been designated a city landmark a city landmark and yeah. you also learned that the state had nominated it for a listing in the national yes, registry of historic correct. places um meanwhile there are these negotiations going on about you know what what they're going to do with the with, with the hall and um the final word didn't come until after you performed and what you thought was going to be the final show mm -hmm. when you found word that that, the, that you you could come to work the next day. Yes, so yes. What was your reaction at that time? Um, that last performance was um, a benefit performance. The musical made it a benefit for um, a charity for children. I forget what the benefit was called. New York something foundation. And it was a total invited audience. It was a really hard show to get through because they were screaming bravo the minute the curtain went up. And they were screaming, don't close, don't go. And we're all up there trying to fight back tears. And it was very emotional. And we still didn't know. And we decided to have a party at the Rainbow Room across the street. We wanted to go out classy. And uh, during that last show, the head stage manager came over to me and said, Rosie, take this. You may need this. And he gave me a piece of paper. I said, what's this? And he said, it's John Jackson's phone number. He was the uh, senior vice president at the time. He said, you may need this tonight. I said, okay. And I stuck it in my costume. And then I brought it to the party. And at 10 minutes to midnight, somebody, and I don't remember who, came up to me and said, Rosie, you have to call John Jackson right now. I went, okay. And um, I asked somebody in the Rainbow Room, is there a phone? We didn't have cell phones back in 1978. And a, a very nice gentleman walked me to the hall to a wooden phone booth, and I didn't, have, didn't bring my evening bag, and I, did, I didn't have any money. He gave me a dime, a dime, made the call, and I went running back into the room and, uh, to make the announcement to everybody that it had been saved and we were all to report to work the next morning. It was, I was elated. Now, I was in New York City that year, and I heard about, you know, all the, the turmoil about the, the, the home might close. Uh, but I had never heard your story no. about how the performers and employees at the hall rallied to save it. Why did it go untold for so long? Bill came up with a great line to answer that question. I did not come up with this. They were not gracious in their defeat, Rockefeller Center. Um, they lost and we won. It was truly a David and Goliath story. The little guy won. And I don't think the Rockefellers uh, liked that, were used to that, and they buried the story completely. And um, Bill and I uh, never worked there again. It took us a year to find out why. Uh, that was naive on my part, I guess, but that's what I mean. That's how pure it was to me. To, I saved this building. They didn't want it saved. They did not want it saved. They wanted to tear it down and build another glass box mm -hmm. 
They had their own construction company. They had their own real estate company. And so, people on the stage said, I don't think so. So how do you feel about what you did? I'm very proud of what we did. I didn't do it alone. Yes, I was the ringleader. I am, I am so proud that every time Bill and I walk by that theater, my heart does that because it's still there. That Christmas show is going on now, right this minute as we're sitting here. Because of what we did, that's a wonderful feeling. It's not an ego trip for me. It's just, wow. And it took me a long time to write the book because I was hurt. I was bitter. Nobody cared that what happened to Bill and I. Uh, nobody said, and I should me, repeat, cancel that. Five, five people out of 500 thanked us. Really? Really. And some of them went on to work there for 20-something more years. Mm -hmm. And it's total strangers, like yourself, and people that I'm meeting now that are sending me beautiful letters and emails saying, thank you for what you did. Long overdue, I guess. Well, it's quite a story. <laughs> yes, it is quite a story. <laughs> and I'm very glad that you told it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It. It, it, I'm very nice that you invited me to do this. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Rosemary Novellino Mearns for joining me. Saving Radio City Music Hall, A Dancer's True Story, has just been published by Turning Point Press for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.